Hi, I'm Professor Mark Rabowski, and this video lecture will explain how to write an op-ed. First, I'll provide some background information on what op-eds are. Then I will give you instructions on your assignment. And finally, I will offer some tips and advice. So let's start with some background information. By now, you should know very well, in traditional reporting, writers should strive to be neutral. They should keep their opinions uh, out of their stories and they should not advocate a point of view. They should get the facts and let the facts speak for themselves. By contrast, op-ed writers should have a point of view, and good op-ed writers find ways to support their points of view convincingly. Editorial writers use facts to persuade people to change their minds, or to confirm their opinions, or to get people to do something, or to stop doing something. So what exactly is an op-ed? Well, an op-ed is an article that states ideas on an issue. These ideas are presented as opinion. The op is short for opinion, and the ed is short for editorial. Op-eds are also sometimes referred to as commentary. The section in which these articles appear is known as the editorial page or the opinion page, and sometimes it includes multiple pages. The purpose of this section is to contribute to community conversation. The newspaper serves as the voice of the community. The op-eds are the voice of the newspaper and its readers. The voice can inform readers, stimulate thinking, mold opinion, and occasionally move people to action. The op-ed section contains a variety of articles and artwork. Let's discuss each briefly. First, editorials. Editorials are usually written by staff, particularly the top editors at the publication, but they usually aren't signed. They usually run 300 to 500 words, commenting on current events, criticizing or praising public officials, and explaining what issues mean to the average reader. During election time, editorial boards typically endorse a particular candidate, which draws a lot of attention to the newspaper. Members of the editorial board, which can number anywhere from one to 10 or more, depending on the size of the publication, usually hold a meeting before they produce each publication and decide what topics to write about and what the newspaper's stance on the issue should be. In the op-ed section, you will also find opinion pieces, which are typically submitted by outsiders. They are like editorials, except they are signed. And rather than represent the newspa newspaper's perspective, they represent solely the opinion of the individual writer. Some newspapers feature regular contributors, such as political pundits like George Will, who writes a weekly political com commentary column. The most successful opinion columnists have a loyal following and have their columns syndicated in various newspapers. In addition, newspapers will sometimes publish opinion pieces by non-journalists. Also on the op-ed page, you will find letters to the editor which are short letters from readers that comment on a previously published article or express an opinion. Such submissions are usually under 200 words. The New York Times, for example, has a 150 word limit. Note that not all letters to the editor that are sent to newspapers get published. In fact, at publications like the New York Times, where they receive hundreds of letters to the editor every day, uh, they only publish a small fraction of them, perhaps uh, five, six, maybe ten at most. And in the op-ed section, you will find what's known as editorial cartoons or political cartoons. Some newspapers hire an artist to draw cartoons that poke fun at or criticize current issues. In the editorial cartoon on the screen, you can see the artist is criticizing President Bush on what he perceives as hypocrisy when it comes to dealing with Middle Eastern countries. Editorial cartoons can be a powerful form of expression. They can grab the attention of readers in a single glance. A photo is worth a thousand words, right? Unfortunately, some are so vague that they are hard to understand. One study reported in Journalism Quarterly revealed an overwhelming failure of nationally syndicated cartoons to get their message across. Most interpretations offered by readers were not at all what the cartoonist had intended. Another important item that appears on the newspaper's editorial page is the masthead, also known as the staff box, which includes a statement providing the details of publication. 
who the editors, photographers, and other key staff members are, as well as a synopsis of the newspaper's editorial policy. The editorial policy will generally tell who determines the content, if letters to the editor are accepted, if advertising is accepted, what the subscription rates are, how errors will be corrected, among other important information. So what's the point of all this? Well, all of these articles and drawings provide a personality and a passion that traditional news reporting does not allow. Long ago, American newspapers were very partisan and biased, even when it came to reporting the news. Today, the editorial page, along with columns and other sections such as sports, are the only places you should find blatant opinions. As the media strives, and the key word is strives, they don't always achieve, but they strive to be objective in their news reporting. So let's discuss your assignment very briefly. You're going to write an op-ed that should be between 300 and 500 words. Remember, you can choose your own topic, but I have to approve it first. Uh, after your op-ed is written, you're going to submit it to me by the di deadline. So initially, you're going to just email it to me first at my email address. Then I'm going to grade the op-ed and send you some suggested revisions. Uh, you'll have a week to make the revisions and you will go and email those revisions to a newspaper of your choice and carbon copy me or blind carbon copy me on that email so this way I'll have proof that you know you made the revisions and uh, if the op-ed gets published you'll receive extra credit. We'll talk about uh, these instructions in more detail later on in this video. You may be wondering how should I go about writing my editorial or my, my op-ed? Well, I'm going to give you several tips, but first let's talk about how you should organize your op-ed. Op-eds, like any journalism article, require structure and organization. They are not free writing. In general, an op-ed should be organized in four steps. First, state the subject and your position on the subject in that introduction. Then discuss opposing points of view. And then prove your position with supporting details and finally draw a conclusion. Now, different journalists have different ideas about how to organize an op-ed, although most will follow the four previous steps. Students in this class are encouraged to consider writing their op-eds this way. First, state the problem or situation. Then, state your position. Then, give evidence to support your position and then state and refute the position of the other side in the conclusion and finally offer possible uh, solutions or a solution to the problem. Now here are some additional tips for writing your op-ed. First let's talk about article length. Keep it tight. Don't ramble or preamble. Have a point and get to it. If background information of an issue is necessary, and it usually is, Recap key facts and summarize the issue quickly, in other words, in one paragraph or less. Remember, most readers have a short attention span. The longer you, your editorial, the fewer the people who will read it. So aim for 300 to 500 words total. Second, let's discuss how to choose a topic. Keep it relevant. You should choose a current, newsworthy topic. By current, I mean something that has happened in the past week or is ongoing. Don't harp on something that has been decided months ago. By newsworthy, I mean choose topics that are interesting and relevant to many people or that people ought to care about. Editorials on obscure topics have limited impact. Don't shy away from controversial topics. In the past, students have written about the environment, teen pregnancy, Facebook, the Yankees, the Iraq War, JuicyCampus.com, gangs in New Jersey, jury duty, dangerous jogging conditions on local trails, and much, much more. The third tip is take a position. Don't be wishy-washy and merely say, this is a controversial issue, or lawmakers need to consider the pros and cons when deciding this issue, or study both sides of the president's economic stimulus plan. Also, avoid cliches and broad platitudes like support our troops. Argue for a certain side, cause, or position develop a strong thesis statement. And avoid using words such as I think or in my opinion in an op-ed. Of course you think it, you're writing it. In reality these words often weaken your argument anyway. 
it is a much stronger statement to say this is an injustice than to say I think this is wrong. Don't leave any doubt in your reader's mind about the stance taken in your op-ed. Next tip, attack issues, not people. Avoid ad hominem attacks such as name calling. If someone's actions are a problem, focus on those actions instead of the person himself. For example, don't say, George Bush is an idiot. Say, George Bush's policies will hurt America because... And keep your cool. It's good to be passionate about an issue, but try not to come across as angry. Angry people usually don't think logically, and they tend to base their arguments on emotions and not facts, which is less effective. My sixth tip, and perhaps the most important one, is this. The old rules still apply. First, your op-ed must be researched carefully and just as thoroughly as a news story. You need sources, quotes from experts, statistics, scientific studies, surveys, etc. Second, in terms of writing an op-ed, many of the same rules for writing a news story apply. Uh, you, need to, uh, you need to have a strong lead and a good finish. Grab readers' attention at the beginning, maintain their interest, and conclude with a thoughtful ending. Your op-ed should also be written in the third person. Never say, for example, I feel or I believe. Like I said, of course you feel or believe what's in your article. You're the one who wrote it. Unless you are sharing a personal anecdote that is essential to illustrating your point, avoid writing in the first person altogether. Therefore, your story should not contain pronouns such as I, we, us, and are. Finally, use Associated Press style guidelines. What is Associated Press style, you may ask? It is the style guide most commonly used in the media. It's sort of to the media what the APA and MLA style are to academic papers, or the papers you write for your, your, your classes at Adelphi. Every year, the Associated Press, the world's largest news organization, publishes a style guide outlining all kinds of different style elements from when to abbreviate to how to capitalize titles. Now it's a big book and I don't expect you to buy it and to learn everything for this class but you should begin familiarizing yourself with it. Online I have posted the 10 most important AP style elements journalists should know. Check them out and be sure to follow these guidelines for your op-ed. You can view the 10 tips at www.cubreporters.org slash AP underscore style. Make sure you type in the URL exactly as it appears on the screen, including the uh, capitalization. I've posted a couple uh, sample op-eds on my website, and you can access these sample op-eds by uh, opening your, your browser and typing into the URL www.cubreporters.org slash sample underscore op-eds. Take a look at uh, the sample editorials, which are uh, from the USA Today, a national newspaper in the Bucks County Courier Times, a local newspaper in the Philadelphia area. You'll notice that they follow uh, the guidelines that I just gave you. They're short, they address newsworthy topics, they cite evidence, they're well written and they attack the issues. Note, for example, that the USA Today didn't personally attack the irresponsible train conductor, which would have been, you know, an easy target for them. Okay, now let's talk briefly about how you can make an effective argument. This is really important for writing an effective op ed because anyone can have an opinion. Usually that's all you'll find in letters to the editor but you're not writing a simple letter to the editor, you're writing an op-ed. A good op-ed uh, makes arguments. So what's the difference between an argument and an opinion, you may be wondering? Well, an opinion is simply your view on an issue. An argument is an opinion that's based on facts, evidence, and logical reasoning, not just feelings and preferences. Okay, opinions aren't enough. You need to back them up with evidence. Uh, and logical reasoning. By backing up your claim, you can persuade readers. If you're merely expressing an opinion, the reader will either agree or disagree with you simply based on their disposition.
or they may remain indifferent. But good arguments can persuade someone to change his mind or to care about an issue he otherwise was indifferent about. Take a look uh, on the screen for an example of a claim that is backed up with a relevant and compelling fact. And uh, hopefully that will give you some idea of how you uh, make a claim based on evidence and logical reasoning. So to reiterate, your op-eds should not only contain an opinion, that is your stance on an issue, they must also be backed up by evidence. Now at this point you may be wondering, well, what do you mean by evidence? There are several different types of evidence that you may use in your op-eds. First, uh, there are examples and illustrations. Uh, they describe or report events, phenomena that exist. Examples are brief statements, illustrations are more detailed accounts. Statistics are also a form of evidence. Statistics numerically represent information about people, events, and phenomena. They may be expressed in raw numbers or summarized in percentages and averages. Another type of evidence is artifacts. These are actual exhibits of such things as objects, audio tapes and videotapes, photographs and diagrams. A fourth kind of evidence is premises. Premises are factual claims that exist as evidence on the basis of their being accepted as reflections of human belief or experience. In other words, these are rules of wisdom such as monkey see, monkey do, or what goes up must come down. Number five on our list of evidence is scientific evidence. Scientific evidence reports the results of field and laboratory experiments on the effect of one variable on another. Finally, there is expert testimony. Expert testimony is interpretive and evalu evaluative statements made by an expert in a field regarding factual information relevant to that field. So, for example, if you're writing about a health issue, you might quote a professor of medicine from Johns Hopkins. Now, take a look at those sample editorials again you'll see that they uh, both contain facts and evidence, both mention surveys, for example, uh, relevant to their position. Note also how they use reasoning to support their claims. Now let's talk briefly about where you can go to find uh, sources for evidence. Uh, now, of course, I realize that a lot of you are in the habit of using the internet and specifically search engines like Google to find uh, information for your papers and speeches but you need to be really careful with this uh, because Google's not always the best source of information. Uh, studies have shown that Google contains only a fraction perhaps you know at best one sixteenth of all the information that's out there on a topic and the information you find might not even be the the best information. You know Google uses a special formula to determine uh, how to rank pages on its website uh, and consequently some of the uh, pages that come up first for certain topics aren't necessarily the most informative or authoritative on the topic uh, you know they, they simply happen to um, you know meet the criteria of Google's algorithm or perhaps the uh, website uh, even uh, hired someone who's familiar with search engine optimization and uh, as a result because they repeat the same word over and over or because they have the word in their domain name uh, they pop up high in the results but in fact there may be uh, sort of obscure not well-known websites that are like the 10,000th result for the for the uh, key term you're looking for that may be much more informative so be really careful if you use Google um, that should just be a starting point uh, and uh, you need to go well beyond you know the first 10 hits the first 100 hits even the first 1000 hits that you find in the Google search engine uh, the best thing to do is just do some good old-fashioned research visit the the local library the campus library and ask a librarian for help they've got all kinds of databases uh, resources books journals that specifically address the topics that some of you will be writing about uh, remember, opinions are also um, a form of evidence, uh, so you can also go out and interview experts on your topics, things like professors, uh, staff, even students. You know, it all depends on what sort of uh, topic you're researching. If, for example, you're doing an uh, op-ed on 
the past presidential election, you know, uh, an expert source might be a uh, professor of political science. However, just talking to some random student you meet at the student center uh, and citing them probably wouldn't be a good source. On the other hand, if you're doing a op-ed on uh, fraternities and sororities and Greek life on campus and uh, whether the college should allow Greek life, then it might make sense to talk to, uh, you know, to a student to actually talk to the president of a fraternity and get some information from him. For a topic like that, a, a student could in fact be an expert source. You know, you need to ask yourself, well, how do they, do they have any specialized knowledge on this topic? How do they know what they know? Uh, would most people consider this person to be an expert on the source? And if the answer for all of those questions is yes, then uh, you may want to consider using that person uh, as a source and citing their expert uh, opinion as a quotation in your op-ed. Uh, and another handy resource is uh, LexisNexis and this is an electronic database you can access it uh, th online through the universe through the college's website and uh, you will be able to find a number of credible sources through here and uh, I think this will be a lot more useful for you than uh, just using Google so let me explain how LexisNexis works so the first thing you want to do is open up a web browser and type in the URL I have listed in red on the screen uh, library.adelphi.edu and that will take you to uh, Adelphi Library's webpage. Alternatively, you can just go to the main web webpage www.adelphi.edu uh, and navigate around there and look for the link for the library. Um, but if you want to get to the library page directly, just type in uh, library.adelphi.edu and once you're there, uh, you want to look over on the uh, right hand side of the page you'll see sort of a, a grayish type um, tab area there and uh, click on the link that says browse databases I have an orange arrow pointing towards it uh, on the screen so you want to click on that so that's going to open up a new web page that lists all of the uh, research databases available online uh, through Adelphi University and what you want to do is scroll down uh, all the way to the letter L and you want to go and click on the link that says LexisNexis uh, Academic. Make sure you click on the one that says LexisNexis Academic and not the one that says LexisNexis Congressional because that's a separate database. So again, uh, make sure you um, click on LexisNexis Academic you will then be uh, prompted to a login screen uh, where you'll have to um, log in your uh, name and password that you normally use to access uh, Adelphi University electronic resources so type that in there and click login and then you will be logged into LexisNexis uh, so what you want to do is, uh, do you see that box in the middle of the screen where uh, next to it it says search terms? Well that's where you will type in um, your topic, what you're searching for. So for example, if your topic is mandatory bicycle helmets, uh, you want to go and uh, you'll type in something like bicycle helmets and mandatory. Remember that uh, this, uh, I think, database uh, normally uses just uh, sort of uh, connectors uh, in terms when you're you're searching for items so you can't uh, sort of just type in natural language like you would into Google so instead you want to just type in uh, key terms such as bicycle helmets or bicycle and helmets and mandatory and and use those connectors like and and or and also note uh, that you can search within all kinds of different databases so you can search within uh, major US and world publications or you could just search within web publications or news wire services or a combination of things uh, you can also specify the date within like the past two years or five years or something like that I recommend it you know searching within the past two years certainly not much beyond the past five years because when you get beyond that point, um, 
you know the information is old and on some of these topics you know the information is changing all the time uh, so even using information that's a few years old may be outdated all right so just to show you as an example I did a search for bicycle helmets and mandatory uh, using uh, major US and world publications uh, within the past two years uh, as you can see dozens of results appeared this is just in the past two years um, for a lot of these topics you may find hundreds of results so uh, you know you'll have to read through these and uh, some information will be better than others uh, or more compelling than others remember you want to use the best information not necessarily just the first three results you find you want to go and sort through this and uh, prioritize and use the best pieces of information you find uh, in your op-ed uh, but this will be a lot more effective than just doing a, a search on Google. You'll find a lot better sources, more relevant information, and more credible information uh, doing a search through LexisNexis. Uh, and before you use any source, whether it's something you find on Google, in a book, uh, on Lexis, or in the New York Times, you want to ask yourself, uh, basically is the information belie believable and you can determine that by asking yourself uh, three basic questions first is the source of information objective or biased to be objective is to be free from prejudgments and bias a biased information source may show a preference for one side many students debating the reform of marijuana laws for example turn to the website of normal or the national organization to reform marijuana laws normal is an advocacy group working in their own words to quote reform marijuana laws end quote much of the information at their website is selected to reinforce their position that marijuana should be legalized or decriminalized so that wouldn't be an objective source instead you might try sources ranging from the new england journal of medicine to science news to the science section of the New York Times. These sources have no interest in the outcome of policy debates over marijuana unlike normal and they would most likely be able to offer objective and unbiased information. The second question you want to ask is what is the relative expertise of the author or reporter? How did they know what they claim to know? Do they have first-hand knowledge? Were they in the place where the ev events they report on took place? Uh, you know, one of the ways it was discovered that Jason Blair plagiarized stories he wrote uh, for the generally respected New York Times is that no travel records to the place he was supposed to have been were discovered. Later it was discovered that he never talked to people in those locations. So being there matters. Besides first-hand knowledge, specialized knowledge uh, on the subject is important. Who would you trust more uh, to give you advice about surgery? A doctor with a PhD in communication or an MD with extensive surgical experience? You'd trust the MD with extensive surgical experience, of course, right? So just because somebody has a fancy title doesn't necessarily mean that they uh, are an expert. So you really need to, uh, to give that some thought. You know, Ask yourself, how does this source know what he or she claims to know? Finally, you need to consider the currency of the information, that is, how recent is the information. Unless it is being used to give historic context, a news report about Iraqi politics from 1984 would shine little light about the current situation, because the regime that was in power, Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist party, no longer rules the country. News reports about Iraqi politics since that regime uh, changed would be much more valuable. Uh, so you should only believe those sources of information when the source is objective, uh, where the author or reporter has relevant experience, and when the information is relevant and up to date. So going back to the types of evidence you can use, you need to uh, consider uh, these three factors that I just mentioned. So for example, with statistics, um, you know, just because you have a statistic doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, accurate. I mean, what's that saying? There are lies, there are damn lies, and then there are statistics. Be really careful because you'll see these days a lot of uh, online polls where websites will conduct surveys and uh, people who are reading the website can click yes or no or, or on you know uh, any number of um, 
multiple choice options and uh, those aren't scientific polls because you know you could conceivably have the same person clicking the same answer over and over and skewing the results of the poll so if you use statistics if you're using a poll for example you want to make sure that it was done uh, scientifically um, Gallup is an organization that's that's known for doing credible scientific polls however if you just see a, a, um, a, a poll on a random website or even CNN.com a lot of them use these web-based uh, polls that I just mentioned and uh, they are not scientific polls uh, you know any anyone reading the website can can respond to them and, and sometimes the same person will respond multiple times uh, similarly with uh, scientific evidence you know just because something is is done in a scientific journal doesn't necessarily mean that it's the it's great information to use uh, for example if you are um, giving a speech about the dangers of the product and a test revealed that it was dangerous you know you want to look into that test further did was the product actually tested on humans or was it just tested on mice you might have completely different results if you test a product on mice than you would if you test it on humans so you know you need to to be cautious of uh, things like that um, a few more tips on uh, determining whether a source is acceptable or not uh, Wikipedia is not an acceptable source and the reason for that is that it is um, a website that is uh, uh, that the public is allowed to edit so basically anyone can go in and change anything about any article on Wikipedia and and people do that sometimes you get pranksters who will um, go into uh, politicians websites and write all sorts of defamatory things or untrue things about them uh, just as a joke uh, and if you happen to be uh, you know a uh, student in third grade doing a, a research paper on uh, you know that politician that day uh, well you'd be in trouble because you know you, you'd have that bad information there it might end up in your paper and your teacher would see it and be like this is not true at all so uh, never use Wikipedia as a source in this class or, or in any other class you know it's fine to go to Wikipedia just to get some general background information uh, a lot of times uh, the articles uh, on Wikipedia will link to credible sources and you can go to those actual sources uh, and and perhaps cite information from them you know if they're an article from the New York Times or something like that but don't actually ever uh, use information uh, on Wikipedia and cite it in uh, a speech also be careful personal home pages and blogs are not acceptable a lot of times you'll see people go and create uh, websites to pay uh, homage to uh, you know their their hobbies or or their favorite actor or something like that and uh, you know a lot of these people have never actually personally met the people they're doing their websites about and um, you know uh, that is not uh, reliable information so don't go and cite uh, personal home pages uh, and blogs by uh, just random anonymous bloggers in your speeches now if it's you know a blog on the New York Times uh, that's maintained by a, uh, a staff writer you know that might be a legitimate source but a blog just by some uh, random person uh, is is not going to be an acceptable source you know again it goes back to those series of questions I mentioned you need to ask yourself well who's behind this this source how do they know the information they know is the information current things like that uh, and if you do that that will uh, eliminate a lot of blogs from being uh, you know uh, used in your op-ed uh, another thing you need to be careful of is um, just because a domain a website ends in org does not make it a good source okay anybody can register for a dot org they don't have to be an organization or a credible uh, individual or anything like that Wikipedia is a dot org um, so don't be fooled by that if you see that in a domain name uh, and also uh, keep in mind that some sources may look good but really aren't when you take a closer look there are some websites that that have like uh, official sounding names or you know they have a very attractive website but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, they're good sources of information uh, and that you can trust them uh, for example um, 
you have the White House's official website, whitehouse.gov. All right, this is a credible source. This is maintained um, by the uh, by the White House, you know, by the president's staff. Although some people might actually say, actually, this isn't that credible of a source, considering that the White House used to, uh, when Bush was in office, post information about WMDs in Iraq, and of course, it turned out there were none. Um, but generally, information on uh, government websites, websites that end with .gov, uh, are credible, generally. Like I said, you still got to ask yourself those same series of questions and, and always be skeptical. All right, now let's take a look at this website, whitehouse.org. So you had whitehouse.gov, which was the official website of the White House. Now we're looking at whitehouse.org. At first glance, this looks pretty official. You might even confuse it with uh, the official website of the White House, of the President. But take a closer look at the website. You'll see it's actually a, a parody. It's, it's not serious information. Um, so even though it has an official sounding name, even though it looks official, it's in fact uh, not a, uh, a credible website. It's supposed to be a joke. So you need, you need to be careful because a lot of uh, uh, websites will go and use official sounding words in their domain names like White House um, or um, you know they, they may use a .org but that doesn't mean they're, they're good sources. Okay here's another example this is the White House Writers Group so sounds very official right this is the White House Writers Group the writers for the White House right the speech writers actually no it's some private consulting firm um, they again have a, an attractive looking website looks very official they've got this official name um, but it has actually nothing to do with the White House. They uh, they don't work for the White House. They're not paid by the government. You know, this is a private consulting company. Uh, so so be really careful um, with uh, websites and website names. In my previous class, some of my students used information from a website called balancedpolitics.org. You can go and check it out in your browser. That's balancedpolitics, one word, dot org. All right, it sounds very official, right? Um, you know, and if you, you, you read the about section of the website, it says that it covers the pros and cons of important topics from a nonpartisan standpoint. Oh, okay, so they're objective, they're biased, right? But take a closer look. You'll see that they don't actually cite their sources of information, so you have no idea where their information is coming from. Uh, there's only vague information in the about part of the website. You don't know who's actually behind the website, which person runs it. Uh, whether they go and do any sort of fact checking on the information that's posted there. So this would not be a good source to use in your op-ed. And there are a bunch of other websites like balancedpolitics.org that you want to avoid using in your op-ed. Sites like uh, Helium, Associated Content, uh, WiseGeek, uh, the list goes on and on. I have some of them up on the screen. Uh, basically the, these websites um, allow anybody to go and contribute articles. They really don't do any fact checking. A lot of times people will just steal information from other sources. They're not reliable websites. These aren't you know expert uh, people writing the articles. They're not trained reporters. So avoid using them uh, in in your op-eds. Uh, and of course if you ever have any questions about whether something is a legitimate source or good source you can always run it by me. Just shoot me an email. Send me the link. Say hey professor what do you think of this source? Can I use this source in my op-ed? Uh, another piece of advice is to make sure that your source is objective. Uh, so here, up on the screen, uh, I've taken a, a screenshot of a web page from Thomas Cooley's Law School. You know, and generally, um, websites in academia, um, universities and colleges and law schools, websites are are pretty good sources. It's usually a safe bet that you're going to find uh, good credible information on there but that's not always the case. Alright, take a look at this page here. Like I said, it's on a law school's website. Uh, basically, uh, what we have here is uh, this law school went and uh, concocted their own law school rankings. So Thomas Cooley is, is not really a well-respected law school. It's regarded as one of the sort of, um, you know, weaker law schools in the country uh, by a lot of people in the legal community um, and I guess they were upset with constantly uh, ranking poorly in the US News and World Report so they decided to come up with their own rankings using their own criteria 
and of course you know the rankings were manipulated in such a way that 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 they came out favorably in these rankings so in this ranking in their own rankings they have themselves ranked number 12 you know in the US News and World Report rankings they're not even probably in the top 200 but here in their own rankings they're 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 number 12 you know uh ranked up uh with such esteemed esteemed uh law schools as Georgetown and and Harvard and and Yale so you know normally .edu websites you know websites of colleges and universities are credible sources but again you need to be skeptical of everything you need to ask yourself uh, those series of questions I discussed you know who's the source of information how do they know what they know in this case Thomas Cooley is the one the, the law school is the one that's deemed itself to be one of the best law schools in the country so not an objective source of information very biased this would not be a credible source okay uh, here are a few more tips for um, you know establishing the credibility of your sources make sure your expert sources are credible generally a person with a professional title such as doctor director attorney etc is more persuasive than a person without one a well-known magazine newspaper or broadcast station such as time CNN the Washington Post is more persuasive than an unknown one make sure that any expert or so-called expert information that you get online is credible many websites are just forums for personal opinions and are not factually reliable to be on the safe side try to use only official websites as evidence as much as possible and make sure your evidence is relevant to your subject you do not want to use information about sleep apnea for example if your subject is about acne unless sleep apnea somehow causes acne now let's talk about how to cite the information you find in your op-ed all right and there are wrong ways to do this and there are correct ways to do this um, if you go and for example find an article in the newspaper say it's in the New York Times and it reports uh, on a new Gallup poll that came out that found that uh, 75 percent of Americans oppose the death penalty alright well, what would the source of your information be would it be the New York Times no the New York Times only reported on the information the source of your information would actually be Gallup they're the ones who conducted the survey okay the New York Times didn't conduct the survey Gallup conducted the survey so how would you cite this well you wouldn't cite it like this you would not say according to a recent study 75 percent of Americans oppose the death penalty why is that wrong I mean it was a recent study after all right and 75 percent did oppose the death penalty well because that doesn't tell us anything about the study it doesn't tell us anything about the source of the study so you can't just you know use anonymous sources like that you need to say whose study it was uh, and as I mentioned it would be wrong to say according to the New York Times most Americans oppose the death penalty the New York Times is only the messenger here they're relaying the information from Gallup so that would be inaccurate also the correct way to cite the information would be to say according to a 2008 Gallup poll 75 percent of Americans surveyed support the death penalty uh, so this way you're listing the source you're you're telling the audience that it is um, you know um, new recent information because you have that that 2008 in there and then you have the information itself uh, if you want to be super cautious you know if you have any sort of doubt about the uh, credibility of the New York Times or you're afraid maybe uh, we got another Jason Blair here a dishonest reporter maybe he didn't report the information accurately then what you might say is the New York Times reports that according to a 2008 Gallup poll 75 percent of Americans support the death penalty uh, so you know you have the source the Gallup poll you have the um, uh, the 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 year 2008 so the audience knows it's relevant and you also have the source in case if people are like well I did I, I looked on the Gallup polls website I didn't see that survey or uh, I I saw that survey in another paper and it said only 50 percent support the death penalty uh, this way you're explaining where you saw the information so that's just if you want to be super cautious but like I said the actual source for this information 
uh, would be the Gallup poll, not the New York Times. So you want to cite the Gallup poll, and you need to cite, you know, uh, at least the year of the survey so that we know it's relevant. I mean, if this is a survey from 1999, well, people's views might have changed significantly since uh, then. Uh, so using a survey from 1999 would not be a good source. Uh, now, last semester, a lot of students uh, like to take information uh, from a website uh, known as procon.org and um, I checked out the website and it looks like it's actually a, a legitimate website it has some good information on there the problem is that uh, it doesn't have its own information okay all it does is uh, cite information from other sources so if you're going as many students did and crediting procon.org you're not giving uh, credit where credit's due you need to go and make sure you give uh, credit to the appropriate sources, to the actual sources of information. All right, Procon.org is just a website that hosts information from different sources. It's not the actual source of information. The same thing with Google. Google is a search engine. You use it to find information, but it's not a source of information itself. So if you're doing a op-ed on um, say uh, that Americans should have the right to die they should have the right to assisted suicide you'll see procon.org has uh, that topic covered as they do many other topics but it would be incorrect to say according to procon.org people have a legal right to die in America all right that's not according to procon.org that's actually according to Neil Gorsuch who is the principal deputy associate attorney general at the United States Department of Justice and he wrote that in his 2000 article the right to assisted suicide and euthanasia that appeared in the Harvard Journal and law uh, and public policy alright that information a, a snippet of that information is posted on procon.org but procon.org is not the source uh, rather Neil Gorsuch is and the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy so that's who you need to cite not procon.org uh, in many cases you may need to also explain your sources just giving us the name of your source may not be accurate enough or may not tell the audience uh, enough about the source to determine whether it's legitimate or not this is especially true when it comes to uh, websites for uh, the media for example uh, the Providence Journal uh, posts their stories online uh, but its website's called projo.com now if you're in Providence most people know projo.com that's the Providence Journal's website but if you're outside of Providence you probably don't know that so if you hear projo.com you'll be like well what's that so instead you want to say the Providence Journal because that's the actual source of the information projo.com is just the the URL for their website uh, similarly the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Daily News the two major daily newspapers in Philadelphia post their stories on philly.com so if you're citing information from philly.com you need to determine whether it came from the Philadelphia Inquirer or the Philadelphia Daily News and uh, you want to cite one or the other not philly.com uh, sfgate.com is, is another one that's the official website of the San Francisco Chronicle a lot of people outside of the Bay Area don't know that so don't say sfgate.com cite the San Francisco Chronicle because uh, they're the ones who actually wrote the story the story came from a report of the San Francisco Chronicle um, and it appeared not only in the newspaper but also on their website so cite the San Francisco Chronicle uh, and the same applies uh, to organizations as, as well as the media for example uh, it's not cancer.org uh, it's the American Cancer Society cancer.org is just the website or the domain name for the American Cancer Society so if you're getting information from cancer.org well that came from the American Cancer Society so you need to explain uh, you need to cite the American Cancer Society if you want uh, to be uh, you know uh, super precise then you can say the website of the American Cancer Society but don't say cancer.org uh, similarly uh, it's not ed.gov it's the US Department of Education all right ed.gov is their website so if you got information at ed.gov you would cite the US Department of Education and uh, the same goes for academic websites it wouldn't be maris.edu it would be Maris College or Maris College's website it wouldn't be harvard.edu it would be Harvard University or the website of Harvard University um, and uh, beyond uh, 
that you may to need to also explain your sources uh, everyone knows popular media outlets like the New York Times and CNN uh, federal agencies such as the Federal Bureau of Investigation or FBI uh, large nonprofit organizations like the American Red Cross and famous people like Bill Gates Abraham Lincoln and Michael Jordan um, but unless you're living under a rock um, you know you're, you're gonna know who all these people are so you can just name really famous sources people places things like this and you don't have to qualify them further however a lot of your sources that you're going to use for your op-ed are not going to be household names most classmate most of your classmates won't recognize them most people in your audience will never have heard of your sources so for example what if you're using uh, the Brookings Institution all right it's uh, a well-respected research think tank in Washington DC and certainly I would consider it a credible source uh, but most people aren't familiar with uh, Brookings Institution so you'd want to go and give a little bit information about them who they are and what they do same thing with Cornell West have you heard of Cornell West hopefully you have okay he's kind of the preeminent scholar on race relations he's a professor I think he's at Princeton now or maybe he's at Harvard um, he switched back and forth uh, from one to the other. A at any rate, a, a lot of people have not heard of him, so you wouldn't want to just say Professor Cornell West. You'd want to go and tell us a little bit about him. You'd want to say Professor Cornell West, a Harvard University, uh, you know, scholar who is uh, considered the preeminent expert on race relations in America. Um, what about BNet? Have you heard of them or Portfolio Media? What about the Yomori Shimbun? that's actually the largest newspaper in the world but because it's based in Japan most Americans are not familiar with it um, so if you're outside of Japan and you're citing the Yomori Shimbun you would need to tell us a little bit about it you would need to say it's a Tokyo based newspaper that's the world's largest newspaper uh, you need to ask yourself these questions about your source would everyone in my audience recognize this source and if not you need to explain the source you need to tell us a little bit about who they are what they are what they do that makes them significant that makes them an expert uh, that makes them a credible source all right if you fail to explain your sources <coughs> and they're not household names I will deduct points so make sure you explain your sources if they need to be explained so now let's go over your assignment in depth first you need to select your topic and what your position on that topic is going to be make sure that your topic is newsworthy and be sure to take a definite stance second select your target publication remember when writing your editorial keep your audience in mind if you're writing for the Delphian which is the student newspaper of Adelphi University there are certain references that almost everyone understands however if you're writing the same article for the Poughkeepsie Journal or the New York Times you may need to explain certain terms the third step of the assignment is to research your topic remember you need more than just an opinion your aim is to persuade readers to agree with you good evidence and sound reasoning is necessary to accomplish that and then write your article after that revise spell check make sure it's an AP style read it out loud is it coherent does it make sense have someone else read it over and make sure you meet the deadline remember uh, first initially you're going to submit this op-ed to me you're going to email it to me and I'm going to review it give you a grade send you feedback and give you the chance to do revisions after you do the revisions you're going to go and submit it to a newspaper for publication so just to repeat you're going to first submit your op-ed to me you're not going to send it to the newspaper first you're going to send it to me I'm going to read over it I'm going to send you feedback uh, and then when you make the revisions uh, you will send the revisions to the newspaper and carbon copy uh, me on them lastly when submitting your op-ed here are some guidelines that you absolutely must follow if you don't follow these guidelines uh, you may not get full credit you want to copy and paste your text inside the body of the email do not attach it as a file if a newspaper uh, 
receives an email that has an attachment, they're likely not going to open it up and read it. They'll just delete it because they're afraid it might contain a virus. So just cut and paste it inside the body uh, of the email. Don't attach it as a file. In the subject heading, write letter to the editor slash op-ed. And uh, remember to BCC or CC me on the email. Uh, and late submissions, of course, will not be accepted. Also be sure to include your name, address, and telephone number. Okay, the newspaper uh, won't go and publish all that information, but they need to know uh, how to contact you so they can verify that you did in fact uh, send, the, um, send them the letter and, and, and not someone else posing as you. And beyond that, don't put anything else in the email. You know, don't put a note, hey, prof, here's my uh, letter to the editor. I hope I get a good grade on it or anything like that. Just put the, 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 the you know, your op-ed in the email and, uh, and no, nothing else beyond that and, and your contact information. Well, that concludes today's presentation. If you have any questions, you can email me at mgrabowski at adelphi.edu. Once again, that's mgrabowski at adelphi.edu.